but I just mostly want to be the best that I can. I mostly just, I do it for myself and I do it for my students. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 31 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Mr. Corey Rose. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, makers of the world's best sparring gear, as well as great apparel and accessories for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of the returning fans. Don't forget our great products, like our lightweight vented sparring gloves. You can find more information about those and the rest of our product line over at whistlekick.com. And all of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a ton more are available at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We put some good stuff in there, and we promise not to spam you or sell your address to anyone. And now to today's episode. On episode 31, we're joined by Mr. Corey Rose, a Taekwondo practitioner and school owner from Oklahoma. Mr. Rose shares a powerful story about his youth and credits martial arts for saving his life. It's a great episode that gets a bit intense at times, but there's obviously a happy ending to that story. And with that, Mr. Rose, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, no, thanks for uh, thanks very much for having me. Anytime someone wants to take a little bit of time to listen to me, I see it as a great honor. Well, the the honor is mine to have you on. You know, we've we've had some conversations online and offline, and uh, it's going to be fun to really dig in and get to know a lot more about you. And of course, we're bringing the listeners right along with us, and looking forward to your story. We we, we you hinted at some pretty good stuff that I'm sure that we're going to get into. So let's let's just start right with it. So tell us how you got started with the martial arts. Oh, uh, that's uh, that's actually probably the the longest part of my story. I had a I was very off and on, had an off and on relationship with martial arts my whole life. It was kind of like something that was, it was just always in the background. But I, I still remember my first time uh, getting involved. I was, uh, it's, it's really rough to say, my memory's terrible, but I was, I was about eight or nine years old. Uh, my parents had just recently divorced and I was, I was a really introverted kid. I was, uh, I was shy. Um, I was picked on. I, I just had terrible self-esteem. I, I wasn't a very physical kid. You know, I wasn't a, uh, football player, basketball player, that kind of thing, um, anything at the time. Uh, my mom, she was really worried about me um, for different reasons, different scenarios. So she found a guy who was teaching uh, martial arts. And to this day, I couldn't tell you the name of the style. I, I think it's kind of one of those things, you know, that up to a certain age, you're not really sure you care. <laughs> right. But I remember it was, right, right. I remember all the terms being in Japanese. It was a Japanese style. Uh, the word Kenpo got thrown around a few times. But uh, I remember my teacher, uh, Sensei Scott Trussler, and this was in the back of a, uh, you know, back of a back of a building. I mean, it looked uh, like an abandoned place. You know, concrete floors and rolled up carpet uh, for the punching bags and all that. Didn't look like a place a kid like me would be in. Um, mm. But I stepped in there and I fell in love with it. I absolutely fell in love with it. It, it was kind of a controlled environment to let myself go a little bit. Uh, but I wasn't able to do it very long. I, I can't remember exactly what happened. I think it was maybe a financial issue or something along those lines, uh, where I was only able to do it for about eight or nine months. And then, uh, you know, my my mother approached me and, and, you know, we said, well, we can't do this anymore, that sort of thing. And so I didn't do it for a while, but I, I, I remember always begging, like, I just, I want to get back in. I want to do it. I want to do it some more. And uh, so eventually, you know, it led where I got to take classes at this place for uh, two or three months at this place for a year. And when I wasn't taking classes, I, I was surprised I didn't get in more trouble than I did. I would find other kids I went to school with uh, that were taking classes at different places. And I said, hey, man, show me teach me, let's work. You know, that's always a great idea. A couple of kids uh, practicing karate together uh, with no supervision, but um, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. I, I learned a lot of stuff. I did get a few injuries. Those were about the extent of my martial arts injuries were, were in those days. But when I hit my, oh, early mid teens, um, I kind of fell off of it. Uh, some issues in the family I ended up uh, living with my dad for a while and he was kind of a pay your own way type of person. I, I really respect that. I really respect my father and the things that he instilled in me. Uh, so I, I, I spent all my time working, um, trying to trying to buy my first car, trying to trying to do all that sort of thing, and uh, uh, made some bad decisions. So I ended up I actually ended up on my own at uh, 16, 17 years old, and I was living out of my truck, um, condemned buildings, taking on whatever jobs I could get. Got myself through high school into college, but you know during that time. Uh, there's a lot of angst. There's a lot of stuff anyway, being that age. And, and, you know, I made some bad decisions. I fell, I fell into some dark things that kind of came back to haunt me later. 
but I got through college, you know, I had a, had a pretty good career and then all that stuff kind of came to a head. You know, I got, uh, uh, without delving too deep into it, I, I had some, um, major problems with depression and anxiety. I had some major problems with, uh, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, um, you name it. I was probably doing it at the time and all that kind of came to a head and I ended up, and this is where really my martial arts story begins. I, I ended up in, well, basically I was hallucinating for about three weeks. Uh, and, uh, I ended up in the hospital, I ended up in ICU. And as I'm laying there and they're kind of cleaning me out, they're puffing all this stuff through. And my wife comes in, my wife now, she wasn't my wife then, but she comes in and says, um, man, you scared me. You know, the doctor said three days to a week and you'd have been dead if they didn't catch you. And, you know, I'm, I'm like barely 20 at this point. And mm. uh, it just absolutely terrified me. So I'm laying there and I'm, I'm thinking about the past and I'm thinking about the future. And one of the things that, um, popped out to me. I started having these epiphanies and it, and it had to do with the hallucinations I was having, but all these little words, all these little phrases. And I started realizing that, you know, I was blaming the wrong people. I was blaming circumstance. I was blaming the people that seemed to be pushing me down. I was blaming this. I was blaming that. And then I realized that, you know, I can't read the future, but every decision I make leads me to where I'm at. And I have some responsibility and no matter what it is that happens to me, and I've got to learn to take that responsibility. Um, yeah. so, you know, I don't, I don't blame anybody for any of that happen, but I'm laying there and I, I'm thinking, and these things start to make sense. All these things, martial arts teachers had told me really were popping out in my head. Um, all these bits of, you know, this little wisdom and philosophy and things that, you know, you kind of read and you either don't really understand it or you don't see where it applies. And then all of a sudden I'm seeing where it, it could have applied at any point in time all through my life. Um, so I got out of the hospital and I, I, I really couldn't find another job. So I was unemployed. I really tried to find another job, but I had a lot of free time. So in that free time, you know, I'm still a little, my brain's still a little muddled. And I, uh, I started studying philosophy. I started studying religion. I started studying culture, um, just all kinds, whatever I could get my hands on in between times. And it was kind of during that time, I ended up in establishing what would later become one of the major cornerstones of the curriculum I teach now, which is something that I call the, uh, the universals or the near universals. And uh, you can think of that kind of like something, you know, you could walk up to, people from multiple cultures, religions, backgrounds, whatever, most of the way across the world. And, and you have to word it right. But if you ask them what qualities, uh, if you, we saw in other people, would make the world a better place? And you have to ask about what qualities you see in other people. If you ask a person what qualities uh, could you show to make the world a better place, you get an entirely different answer, which is just kind of a, a funny take on that. But anyway, so you, you get those common answers like, uh, you know, the extreme levels of courtesy, if people showed more integrity, if they would keep their word, um, people showed more perseverance, more courage, things like that, you know, th things that were universal. And uh, I started trying to figure out how to apply it to my life because that was kind of always my problem with philosophy. So I'm getting off on a tangent here, but that was kind of always my problem with philosophy was the application of it. Right. And was, like I was saying, a lot of people look at it and they think, um, well, uh, it's hard to understand or it only applies to a certain circumstance or whatever. And in my mind, wisdom had to be something that was universal, something that worked across the board, right? Uh, whether you're talking about, and this is something we deal in martial arts all the time, whether you're talking about uh, a fight as in a physical struggle or a fight as in a mental struggle or, or even a debate or an argument with another person, I felt like it all had to be there. Kind of like, uh, kind of like spirituality. A lot of people kind of taboo that word in different circumstances, but Regardless of your religion, in my opinion, spirituality is not some mystic thing that's out there. It's, it's what's all around us right now. Um, it's how we react. It's how we see things. It's how we perceive things. And that kind of relates into, into our spirituality. Anyway, so in my opinion, martial arts kind of helps to bridge that gap, I guess, between uh, philosophy and application. So, uh, for example, Bruce Lee, I think we all like Bruce Lee, right? And he had this famous quote about, uh, you know, be like water. And you can see where that applies to whether you're taking a hit in a sparring session. You can also see um, where that applies to just adapting in general to, to life scenarios and things like that. You know, in martial arts, I started, uh, you know, can reach across social issues, too. That's one of the things I've noticed, you know, any issues that are challenging society, martial arts has the opportunity to be on the front end of that, whether it's, uh, you know, obesity or race issues or uh, sexism issues, religious issues. You know, think about martial arts and it is where, you know, people from all kinds of backgrounds come together and they come together for a common goal to, to get better, to help each other get better and, and, and to work together. And I think it's an amazing, you know, amazing thing. 
Anyway, I got a little bit off subject. So, so where, where this kind of comes back down to it is uh, I'm working graveyard shifts. So I tried to start a business detailing cars for people. And I found this school. Uh, I'd never done Taekwondo before, but I found this Taekwondo school. And they offered to teach me if I washed their cars once a month. You know, and I, they just kept telling me, come here and try, come and try it. I wasn't real sure. I had a fear of uh, large groups, I guess. Um, mm. Anyway, one day I went in and I looked around and I was like, wow, you know, this is amazing. Like, I, I'm not hearing anyone say the words, but I'm looking around and it's just the atmosphere. And, and I'm seeing all these things that, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of look around and wish they saw more of in the world. And I'm seeing them being practiced. I'm, see, I'm seeing them being applied. I'm seeing, uh, and it was probably in every dojo, dojang, every, everywhere I'd ever practiced before. But I guess I was too young. I just didn't get it. You know, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't see it um, the same way. Anyway, I, I ended up joining and they, they, they taught me a lot. And uh, when I got up to my advanced ranks, they started, uh, they, they, they saw my anxieties and they started throwing me up in front of classes, especially kids, which is absolutely terrifying if you don't have any, any uh, experience. In, in work. Of course, yeah. It, it absolutely terrified me. But it was kind of that moment where they were like, look, you can let your anxiety choose this for you, what you do in your path, or you can take charge of your life. And here's how you take charge of your life. You let that anxiety go and you just push through. And I did. And you know what? I found I really, really enjoyed it. And, and I, I it just it just fell on me. And all the work I'd done in my life, all the different career paths I tried to take, all the different things I tried to study all before in my life, I never really knew what I wanted to do. And I, I kind of just walked through my life like uh, like a chicken with his head cut off. You know, Ooh, that's shiny. Let's, let's go over here. Let's try this. And uh, it all kind of kept falling flat and I kept changing. And then here I am doing this. And I, I, I felt different. I, I mean, I, I actually for the first time in my life, this might sound a little crazy, but I felt like I was on the right path. I felt like I was doing something good. I felt like I was doing something that was meant for me. Um, mm -hmm. And shortly after I got my black belt, that school ended up uh, closing down. And so I moved down to where I'm at now and started uh, teaching because it was kind of a passion. I didn't have any money still. I was bouncing around between minimum wage jobs and stuff and still hadn't got a job back in my career. And then my wife kind of says, why don't you start teaching? Um, so I found a few kids and I was like, hey, you know, you guys want to learn some martial arts and started the school. And, you know, here I am now. And now that's uh, I gave up on the job search. You know, I had my parents always, when are you going to get a real job? You know, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity. But I was like, you know what? I feel like I'm on the right path. I'm going to stay with this. And I stayed with it and uh, trained under whoever I could, took any seminars I could. I've actually, I'm one of those probably strange people that's tested for every level of black belt under a different person or a different group. And, uh, but I made it to where I'm at. I'm very happy with where I'm at. That's awesome. So what I'm hearing, the common thread as we go through your life is that the clarity, the, the times that you're talking about where you've experienced clarity is when you've been in the martial arts. It sounds like at any of the times when you strayed away from martial arts, you got lost. That's exactly I mean, is, that, is that a fair? That's exactly right. And, I, and I'm not trying to say that, you know, my path is for everybody or anything like that. I, but yeah, every time I strayed away from the martial arts world, I did. I, I became lost. I felt like I didn't know where I was going or where I was. I felt like the whole world was coming against me. And then as soon as I'd set foot on that mat, and it didn't matter who it was under or who I was with or who I was training with or if I was working with kids or adults. It, it didn't matter. It, that all just disappeared, you know, and I was me and I felt full and whole and complete. And uh, so, yeah, I've made it my life's my life's passion now. And I think that's great. And I, you're right. Not not everybody's path is going to be your path. I think, you know, there's a good chance that the majority of the people listening to this show right now probably do feel something similar to you. I mean, I, I certainly feel the same thing that you do, that there's something very grounding about martial arts as a passion. And you don't have to have martial arts as your passion, but I think it's important for everybody to have that passion, whatever it is, to find that thing that grounds you. For some people, it's running or weightlifting or art. You know, It doesn't even have to be a physical pursuit, but just to find that thing that roots you to the ground and makes you feel like you is just so important. Yeah, that's right. Um, and I know that this story you know, sounds more like a personal story than martial arts, but I'll say you know, when you really are passionate about something, I mean, truly passionate about something, it is you and, and you are part of it. it. It's a big part of you. You're part of it. So, you know, I don't separate the two. I don't separate the idea of this is my martial arts life and then this is my regular life. I mean, a lot of people use the word and throw that term out there and say martial arts is a lifestyle. And I, I, I truly believe that. And so, you know, the reason I tell more of a personal story when it comes to, to get into martial arts is, is it, martial arts is my life. It, it really is at this point. And not always just the physical training and stuff, but the mental aspects that come with it, the, the, philosoph the philosophy that comes learned with it. It helps me gain 
I guess a better understanding of myself, better understanding of where I'm at, you know, and what I can do for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. And it's funny that, you know, one of the things you're bringing up, bringing up for me as I'm listening to you and this is probably going to come across a little self-serving and that's not the intent. So I won't even tell people where they can find it, but we put out a piece, uh, kind of a poster meme sort of thing last week uh, with a quote, martial arts isn't about fighting. Martial arts is about using the idea of combat to make yourself a better person. And it goes on and says some other things, but that, you know, you really kind of reminded me of that and how uh, resonant that idea has always been for me that, you know, we, when we talked about martial arts, a lot of people hone in on that first word, the combat aspect. But if you break it down as, uh, you know, an English construct, you know, like we would in an English class, what is the noun? The noun is art. You know, it is a martial art, not a martial art. Right, right. No, I, I, I'm totally with you on that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things like, like, uh, you know, the, the training, training and physical combat can really, you know, help you calm you down. And, and, and I'm all about, I've always been about, I just mentioned the, the universals earlier. And that's what I like about martial arts, martial arts concepts. You can read it in all kinds of, of books and things like that, but it really all comes down to perspective. And when I was laying in ICU, I think that's one of the biggest things that kept popping back in my head was perception. It's all about your perception. So all through my life, I'm like, oh, these things out to get me, this person out to get me this, that, and the other, whatever, i got to hide from it, or i got to cut this part of myself away. And then it kind of just occurred to me, no, that's just how I looked at it. That was my perception. I created my own reality, I guess, in a sense, right? So we always talk about if you think positive, you see positive. You think negative, you see negative. You kind of attract what it is um, that you put out there. And I was always thinking negative, and so negative was always happening. And it was all in, in how just really how I looked at my life, how I looked at where things were going, how, how I looked at things in general. And I had to change all that first um, before I could find myself out of the, the, the pit I had dug myself in. I mean, it, to give the idea of the, the perception, it's kind of like, um, i give an example. It's kind of like if you have a, a young kid that's had a, a pet for their entire life, that pet becomes their best friend, right? I mean, they're really super attached. And then you have someone in their 30s and uh, uh, they have a mentor um, for the past 25 years or whatever, someone they're really close to, like a father figure. And now this little kid's pet dies, and then this this older gentleman's uh, uh, mentor dies. Can you honestly, from a third person perspective, say that the kid's pain is less because it was an animal than this older person's pain is greater because it was a person or because there was a longer relationship? But realistically, it's all based on your perception. If you were that little kid, you would think, "Hey, man, you know, mine's just my situation is just as hard." is his so you know it all comes down to how you look at it and personal victory works the same way a little kid first learning to walk feels you know a great sense of accomplishment and uh does that make an adult's sense of accomplishment at learning how to do a backflip any 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 greater um just because everybody can walk and not so many people can do a backflip you know it all comes down to perception and how you look at it yeah couldn't agree more so that was a great window into who you are and i know we're going to get a lot more of that as we move on but i want to move on to the next part of the story the, the story the questions the interview the conversation which is your best story <laughs> there we go that's what i was looking for so cut out all the rest give us your best martial arts story right uh story man there's a lot of stories it's it's always really hard to choose something like that um, I got a couple martial things. Artists always have the best stories. That's why I started this show. <laughs> yeah, because I wanted to hear all the great stories. Yeah, and I mean, uh, a couple of mine might sound a little, uh, a little self self serving, but uh, I'll say, you know, for me, let me just kind of prelude that with it's always the little things, you know, the little stories, in my opinion, are the best stories, but they, they don't always make the 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 greatest entertainment, I guess. But for me, I think you know, my favorite stories always relate to when I'm. Um, uh, so I've given a chat in class, you know, and I'm looking around going, this is in one ear, out the other. These guys are all like making excuses when this doesn't apply. And then two weeks later, someone comes up to me and says, hey, man, that's what I really needed to hear. And I, it's got my it's got my butt in another gear, you know, or when so you ask some question to a bunch of little kids, you don't think any of them could ever possibly come up with a, a reasonable answer. And they, they they spit out something so deep that just leaves you mind blown. You know, those are kind of my favorite stories. Um, but I'll say I got two in particular that pop out to me. 
we attended uh, i didn't get to participate but i did get to go i didn't get to participate because my son with me but me and my wife and my son we attended a uh, seminar with uh, uh mr wallace with superfoot wallace uh back in in lawton oklahoma back uh, uh last year and i think it was just such a super cool thing that as he's teaching the seminar you know my son starts to get a little out of hand my son's a little rowdy and he was two years old at the time and they're running this drill and mr wallace comes up and he's talking to him he's talking to to my son axel and, and uh, Axel's like pretending his karate moves out there, and uh, yeah, Bill Wallace just kind of uh, challenges him to a to a spar match right there, and, and he let me get it on video, and I got to watch my son, you know, <laughs> out there kicking uh, my two year old son, kicking Mr. Wallace in the legs, and throwing that back fist, you know, that front hand back fist, and and I just thought it was hilarious. I I think my other my other favorite story though is I I, I have yet to have tested done a black belt test uninjured, and uh, so. I'm going to speak on it. And it's always it's always the little things, you know, my first degree black belt test. I was uh, helping out with like a kid's night and I did this. Uh, I did this somersault. And I just got up and I couldn't straighten my back. And I was like, <laughs> what, what, what just happened? Uh, come find out I'd torn something um, up around my shoulder blade. My, my black belt test was a week later. Uh, I made my way through that. Um, but I think the, the best one was my second degree. I, I had put off my second degree testing for, for quite a while and I had to travel um five hours to take my second degree test and i've been putting it off for months and months and months i didn't really want to do it i didn't feel ready and uh when i finally did decide i was going to do it then two weeks beforehand i broke my foot um i actually shattered the the, the knuckle of my pinky toe and, and broke the, the metatarsal there but i decided no i'm going to test forget it i'm, I'm going to test anyway you know and uh i showed up to it and I had just recently, maybe the, the, the previous year, started to get involved in creative martial arts, extreme martial arts, tricking, that sort of thing. I'm not good at it. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I just I just like to play around with it. Yeah. And uh, That's good stuff. Yeah, the guys I was testing under at the time, they were like, hey, well, you want to put on a little display for us? You know, I want you to do something. So I decided I was going to. And then I told them that day, I said, look, you know, I got this broken foot. I don't know if I can do this. And they basically begged me and said, just take the elements out that are going to hurt your foot, you know. Uh, well, I had a I had a 540. I had a touch rise kick. I had a hyper feel long all landing on my right foot, the broken foot. Right. And I think, OK, I'll just take them out while I when I do my form. And uh, but, you know, how it is and you get into your form and you really get going, you know, and you're just so, yeah. so ingrained in, in the motions. And I practice this thousands and thousands of times. And I saw the video later and you can tell it hurt because uh, it looked terrible. But uh, at the same time, it didn't hurt at the time. So. I was getting into it, and then suddenly I did that 540. I'm in midair, and I remember thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> this, this is just going to be terrible. But I landed, and I was like, oh, I got it. It didn't hurt. On and on and on, and I just kept going. I got through the form. I thought, this is fantastic. Started to walk off the floor. Just collapsed. I mean, just just <laughs> fell. And I, mean, I don't mean like graceful collapse, you know, fancy roll out of it, nothing. I mean, face plant to the mat. Just, just smack. Um, and uh, that was the only time I ever got a bloody nose in martial arts. <laughs> But uh, I always found that kind of be a funny story where I somewhat humiliated myself a bunch of, of a bunch of black belts I didn't know. But they, I did pass. I, they, they did give it to me. Um, I, I managed to break my boards. Just had to use the other foot. Um, and then after that, I, I, I took a good three months off to let that foot heal. Ended up breaking it four or five more times across the next two years. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's you're doing. You're doing something. Mm -hmm. You're doing something with that foot that I, I don't want to do with my feet. <laughs> um, so those are great stories. And I, and I got to ask that the video of Mr. Wallace and your son, Axel, do you still have that? Of course I do. Why could I? I couldn't you, get rid of something like that. Okay. Would you be willing to let us put that in the show notes? Of course for I the listeners? Okay. Because I can't imagine there's anybody lis listening to this right now that wouldn't want to see that. Uh, of course. Bill Wallace has been on the show. Great man, friend of the company, friend of the show. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sure he would get a kick out of seeing that again, too. Oh, yeah, I'd be glad to. So awesome. Awesome. Well, look for that, folks. We'll we'll put that up at whistlekickmarshartsradio.com. Great. And I know we're going to work in some more stories as we move along, but I'm going to twist the next one a little bit. Where do you think you would be today if you hadn't gotten into the martial arts? Um, well, I think I already kind of answered that. Uh, I, and and it, this isn't a this isn't a oh well that might not have happened or any of that. This was this was pretty definitive. I would not be here. I mean, I would I would uh, I'd be dead. Um, and I can I can say that with a hundred percent. And that's why I say my life. And I can say that with a hundred percent guarantee 
Um, like I said, as I was laying there in the hospital, uh, that's that's what was said to me. You know, give it, give in um, three days or a week uh, without help, and and I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't have made it. Now I know I, I wasn't necessarily involved in martial arts at that time, but let's talk about the year after for just a second. Um, yeah. You know, I think we all know through the martial arts that when you create goals or if you want to change something about yourself, sure, you want your long term goal, right? You want you want your big thing. But five year goals don't just come in five years. They happen in your decisions every day. Um, and and any any goal that you might have that's long term, you, you've got to start small. If you if you want to lose weight or, or if you want to uh, uh, stop losing your temper as much or, or whatever, you can't just you can't just up and, and cold turkey that you know you've got to you got to start with something small and you got to make that a habit a small little reminder and you have to make that a habit and once that becomes a habit then you can build on that and so even if I had got out of the hospital uh, and and this did happen uh, across that next year of course now I can't suddenly I can't provide for my family suddenly we're living off um, next to no wages my son's born during this time and uh, or well a little after but. Uh, all this, uh, the pregnancy, uh, you know, all this stuff is going on. And I had moments and I had these doubts and, and these fears. And and I came, even with martial arts in my life, I came very close to making some serious mistakes and it, and, it, and falling right back into my old habits. Uh, but it took that one step at a time, being in that right environment, being with the right people, uh, being shown a purpose and given a purpose uh, through the martial arts that helped me to stay on that path. Uh, rather than I, I, I feel like even if I'd end up in the hospital, even if they'd saved my life, if I hadn't found martial arts after that, I'd have went right back and I'd have went yeah. right back into what I was doing. So I, I'd say if it weren't for martial arts, I would not um, I would not be here today at all. And that's pretty Im impressive to be able to say that. I think a lot of us can, can say that figuratively. You know, I wouldn't be where I am. You know, I, I'm, I would have gone off. I would have done something else. I, I don't think I would have achieved the, this. what I consider the success that I've had in my life, the things that I've done that I've been proud of, but I would still be alive. And so I think that that's pretty powerful. It's pretty amazing. That's part of why I was excited to have you on the show to share that because there aren't a lot of stories that go to that extreme. And I'm always a big advocate that everyone should at least try martial arts. Mm. And here's a great example why, because, you know, how much time when you know at that point where you're in the hospital if you were to add up all the time you had in the martial arts how long had you been training oh man um i'm gonna do a little quick math here yeah. probably about you know honestly probably i mean like i say it was a few months here a few months there would have been a, about three a little over three years maybe four years okay so three years of martial arts training and how old were you again uh when i was in the hospital yeah i was 20. okay so three years of martial arts training gave you enough of a foundation to save your life at 20. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and then, and, and that, yeah, and then finding and that's that That's huge. That's huge. I mean, that, that catapulted you through so many things. And, I, and, and that's, that's the impact of the martial arts. And I know I'm preaching to the choir when I talk about this on the show. But I just constantly reinforce it because I want people to hear it. I want people to go out and help spread that and and not to just spread the 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 so to speak gospel of the martial arts that martial mm -hmm. arts is great but you know uh, people come up to me a lot and then they say you know what do, what do you think about my kid getting into martial arts i say you know six months give your kids six months of martial arts because there's nothing else that they can get into that will give them longer term re return on that investment of mm -hmm. that time the martial arts. Six months of soccer is not going to have an impact twenty years later. No, definitely, and and enough time it make it makes such a huge impact. I mean, even if martial arts not your path, I know we kind of talked about that earlier. It, it's still very beneficial. The way martial arts is taught, you know, you learn about personal victory. You you learn about defeating your demons. You know, you learn about self control. You learn about how to succeed. And I, I mean, I don't want to sound like a self help book here, but let's face it: nine out of ten self help books you pick up usually have. Uh, some a, a similar theme to them. You got to believe in yourself. You can't doubt yourself. You've got to see what you can overcome. You've got to erase your doubt. You've got to not fight your fears. Just just don't give them don't give them any credibility. And and these are all things that uh, you know you learn to push through through martial arts training. So regardless of what you want to do, I think everybody wants to be successful. So regardless of what they want to be successful in, 
martial arts can really help give that foundation of, of helping to be successful and well-rounded in whatever you do. Absolutely. Couldn't say it any better. Awesome. So I want to know about some of the people that have influenced you. I'd, I'd like you to tell us about, you know, I'd like you to hone it down to one, but if you got to go to two or something, that's okay. Tell us about the people that you would say have had the biggest impact on your martial arts career. Oh, wow. Biggest, biggest impact. Now, if, 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 you know, normally I'd want to go to an instructor or someone who supported me or something like that. But honestly, when you're going to talk about the biggest impact, it's going to be my wife and my son. Um, and kind of put it this way, my wife didn't have any martial arts training. She did a lot of yoga, stuff like that. She was very, um, she was very flexible. You know, she had a lot of natural talent. But when I started training again as an adult, she was very supportive of it. She saw how it was helping me. You know, and she she was there. I mean, I met her when I was 18. Um, she was there through all of this and she saw my struggles. She saw my hard time. She saw my fall and she stayed with me to help me rise back up. And she saw that this was helping me rise back up. So um, even though she wasn't training with me per se, you know, I come home and I get frustrated. Something would be going on. And she said, let's practice. Let's practice. She said, I, I, uh, why don't you show me how to do it? You know, and I'll help you do it. And she'd hold pads for me. And pretty soon sparring became the household game. You know, we're like, <laughs> I'm serious. We're a couple of adults, but just, just running around the house. It's like our family game, right? It's just a sparring all the time, wrestling. You know, we're, we're always kind of doing some stuff like that. But, but she supported me 100 percent of the way. You know, her, my son, my son obviously pushed me just by by being there. And then, you know, my father really gave me a good foundation. I didn't understand that until years later. But, you know, I have a lot of respect for my father to, to for helping me get where I am today as well. That's awesome. Great. Great answer, and, and it's clear that, you know, you're not just talking about martial arts is a lifestyle or should be a lifestyle, but, you know, you can hear in your answers, it, it is your life. I mean, it's threading itself through everything that you're doing, your home life, you know, your school and, and, and everything else, and I think that's fantastic. Oh, yeah, my wife, my wife changed now, too. She just recently got her um, first degree. Uh, Great. Black belt. She's trained for a long time, and she's helped, started helping me teach. It's, uh, it's become quite, quite a little family business for us. Good. And I, and I think that's, that's the way to do it. I think that's the best way to do it. I, when I see those families that, that do martial arts together, my instructor's son um, went off to become an absolutely tremendous Taekwondo practitioner and, and school owner. And uh, he was actually on the show. I forget what episode, uh, Master Leonard Jordan, mm. somewhere, somewhere around 10, 12, somewhere in there. So, um, Awesome. Yeah. So we've, we've heard a lot about your background and your beginning, but let's, let's talk about your time getting out there, showing what, what you can do. You know, we talked in the pre-interview that, um, you don't have a ton of time with competition, but I'm sure you've got some stuff in there and I'm guessing you're being a little humble. So why don't you tell us about you getting out into the tournament scene? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done it. I've done it some. I did it a couple times as a kid. And, uh, you know, before I got my black belt, I was, I was a lot more um, involved with it, I guess, during that time than any other time. You know, I'm kind of one of those people that I, I love to compete. I love to compete with other people, but I, I don't necessarily believe there has to be judges or, or any of that. So, you know, we have like uh, what we call a fight night every Friday night. And, I'll spar with my students. We invite other schools over, you know, that come up uh, other black belts and you know, we just play around and have fun. So I don't really feel much of a, a need to compete, but I, I still do it. I still do it. Uh, oh, every every one, one or two events every year, sometimes three. Sometimes I'll spar. Sometimes I'll do form. Um, I'm just I'm just not overly competitive. Now, my wife, on the other hand, she competes a lot. Uh, mm. And we have a lot of students that do too. I, I'm just not uh, not overly competitive with anyone anyone but myself. And I guess the deal of it is is uh, most events are, are really great, but you know sometimes you run into the ego, and, and I, I don't like you know getting involved. I don't even like uh, putting myself in a position where ego can be involved by anyone. I, I, I just don't want to see where that plays out. But yeah, I've done some tournaments. I I've, uh, I can't say I've ever done necessarily fantastic. I've, not gotten a lot of, I've not gotten trophies a lot more than I've gotten trophies, you know? Uh, and then I really, I really didn't get, I, I, like I said, I didn't do much once I was a black belt, but I still do it from time to time, mostly because I just love standing there and watching the other black belts um, and, and looking and going, I want to work to do that. You know, I, I want to be able to do it as well as this person did it as well as this person did it. Um, I find it fantastic. I, I think competition has a great place for some people. 
Um, and we have students that compete. And it's just one of the, another one of those things, not necessarily for everybody, but some students really need it, you know. No, it's certainly not for everybody, but it's one of those things that because it's so different, it, it is 180 from training in the dojo, the dojang studio, whatever you call it, that it, it's something I, I think everybody should try once. Mm -hmm. Do, would you agree? Yeah, you know, just to get out there, check it out. It's a fun game. You know, I, I hear a lot of people um, go go off on sport karate or point sparring or all kinds of different competitions. You know, there's all styles of competitions out there. I, you know, you hear people go off on them sometimes, but in my opinion, it is looking at it wrong. It's a game, right? It's a fun game. It's a test of skill. Um, yes, these things can be used in self defense. Sometimes so, sometimes not. Yeah, sometimes the rules are a little different, whatever. But in my opinion. Um, You know, I, and I'd say this to my students, we offer the chances to compete in lots of different stuff from semi-contact kickboxing to point sparring to uh, uh, full contact Kyokushin and, and Olympic style and, and all kinds of things. Because I kind of tell them, like, look, if you really want to be able to defend yourself, then I ought to be able to and you really have control of yourself. Then I ought to be able to walk up to you and say, okay, today you're not allowed to do this, but you are allowed to do this. You know, I ought to be able to lay a bunch of rules on them and they ought to be able to follow those rules. And um, I think it's a fantastic test of test of skill. It's a it's just a fun game to play, no matter how you how you compete in it. And a lot of events are really a good teacher of that self control. That uh, you know, taking the hit and hitting each other, whatever. Then you get you get up, you hug, you go out after the tournament, you know, have dinner, whatever. And and you're still friends. And it's I think it's absolutely a, a fantastic testament to the change of perception a person gets uh, within the martial arts. I think competition is kind of the epitome of that. Yeah, and I think a lot of the people that make the criticism of martial arts competition, they're doing it from they're they're coming in from the perspective that martial arts competition is equivalent to using your martial arts in a self-defense situation, which obviously it's not. <laughs> not the same thing, not the same thing. But you know, I think everyone that teaches, they they kind of teach in a couple different styles depending on the class. They may have a separate class for competition style. They They may only teach sport karate, but I think uh, uh, most teachers or mo most schools still go, okay, well, 90% they don't necessarily train for the competition. You know, they, they're still training in their style. They're still training for self-defense scenarios, but the competition just is another additive, another aspect, another test of those skills, you know. Ab absolutely, and it's it's the same reason that still in, in most martial arts schools, there are forums, kata, pum, say, whatever you call them, still those those forms it's a way of practicing it's a way of engaging the martial arts in another way and i think for most of us to get out on the competition floor it's facing our fear mm, definitely definitely most people don't do well in front of groups I, i i think still the biggest fear in at least this country is the fear of public speaking and people put that f above and beyond uh plenty other things that are a much greater threat to their life. Mm. But it's still the greatest fear. And I attribute my ability to do something like this, where I'm talking to you knowing that this show is going to go out and a whole bunch of people are going to listen to it, or my ability to go to a martial arts school and stand up and present to people that I've never met before. I throw all that back to my teen years on the competition circuit, competing in front of hundreds to thousands of people at you know, all over New England. It's exactly, that's exactly it. You know, it's the same thing as what my instructor, he used a different tool uh, before I got black belt and he saw those anxieties, that group anxiety and couldn't get me to go to competition at, for a little while. So, you know, he started throwing me in front of classes and it's just like, that was another tool for him to help me overcome my anxieties. Uh, competition is, is another, another tool in your instructor's toolbox, I guess, to, to help students with the real underlying issues, uh, the, the anxiety of, Well, whatever their anxieties might be, it might be public speaking, it might be um, performing in public. My issue was, you know, I never had a problem performing in public. Mine was having to speak in public. Um, when it came to the performance, I was fine because once I started doing my thing, right. that was it. And I, I had to learn to translate that to public speaking as well. You know, just just let go and be yourself and and just do it. I guess I, I use I use that slogan a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good. It's good. Right there with you. Glad we're on the same page. Now, you've bounced around, you've trained in some different arts with some different people, but if you could train with somebody that you haven't, tell us who that would be and why. 
you know, I'll put a lot of thought into this. I, I actually have. I put a ton of thought into this because I do go around to seminars. I do. I, I love to train as many people as I can. Um, and honestly, it depends on my focus for that day. Uh, for example, like if I'm on a stretching, fitness, and kicking day, I have horrifically tight hips. So if I'm working on something like that today, I would love to have Mr. Wallace around. You know? uh, yeah. Not to mention his sense of humor. And I watched him and, and how much fun he was having and, and how he was able to get people to push beyond their limits. Um, through a sense of humor, I'd never seen it done quite like Mr. Wallace can do it. It was fantastic. Um, you know, I'd also like an opportunity to train with Jackie Chan just because I, I think it would be fun. I think I would really yeah. enjoy it. Or uh, the other, my third, my number three would be Jet Li. Um, really love a chance to train with Jet Li. Two of my favorite martial arts actors right there, Jackie Chan, <laughs> Jet Li. Uh, of course, I've been fortunate enough to, to train a little bit with Mr. Wallace. And um, I've actually spent more time with him not training, which is kind of fun. And yeah, that sense of humor that he has that comes through for anyone that's met him or, or, or heard or watched him in video or something all the time. He is always on. He is always a riot. And he just people are just naturally drawn into him and and it's i think it's from that it's just genuine love of life yeah and we have the same style it's contagious. yeah and we, we have the same style when it comes to sparring I, I that's what i love about it like everything he said at the seminar hit with me i'm a front leg kicker um i lead with the front hand all the time and and you know so everything he said uh, you know all the seminars i've ever i've ever attended or even found a video of I'm like yeah that's that's my style you know that's that's how i do it <laughs> so right on yeah Awesome. You a movie guy? You got any mar favorite martial arts movies you want to share with us? Um, I am. I am actually a very big movie guy, uh, but I have an issue with uh, giving a favorite because I'm a big movie guy, but I'm not a I'm not a great movie critic. I'm kind of one of those people that I enjoy movies, and I, I get in these conversations, and someone will say, "Hey, you seen this martial arts movie?" And I'll I'll start to say, "Yeah, I thought it was fantastic," but then they'll cut me off. Oh, it was horrible, wasn't it? That choreography was. I'm just not a good martial arts critic uh, or movie critic because I'm 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 an enjoy the ride kind of guy. You know, I put it in to kind of just watch something and enjoy the enjoy the ride. But I do like pretty much any movies um, related to martial arts, old and new. You know, I like the on box series. I like the it man series. And um, I like yeah. the old Kung Fu TV series. That was a big one for me. That's not a movie, I guess, but. No, it's it's still video. I mean, maybe we have to. The, the reason that question is movie is because the TV options are so limited. That's true. That's very true. Um, you know, the the hope is that people listen to these shows well into the future. But you know, here it is, 2015, and coming up, I think it's soon. Might even be in the next week. AMC is releasing their new show, Badlands. Oh, I've heard that. I've heard about that. Which looks amazing and the people that they have involved in it bring a lot of credibility so maybe we'll be able to talk about more martial arts television in the future hopefully that'll inspire more and more because i'm like you i want to see all of it i think it's all fantastic the the good the bad the ugly you know just just give me more and if you've listened to the show you know that people aren't always picking what critics would call great martial arts films right they're picking ones that often resonated with them for you know some other reason either who they saw it with or how old they were when they saw it you know it's it's often re reasons completely unrelated right so if if somebody had to pin you down and say you get to pick one to watch for the rest of your life what would it be oh and only get to watch one martial arts movie wow i, I have two that pop out in my head right now but i can't even remember the the title of one of them so I'll go ahead and show. I liked Fearless, uh, Jet Li's Fearless. Yeah, yeah, yeah with Jet Li, that was a fantastic movie. Was that the? Is that the one where he kicks the pool ball? Oh man, you had to catch me. I or is that Hero? It. I haven't seen it in about a year. Uh, <laughs> either Fearless or Hero. Um, and and I'm sure somebody's out there screaming at the speakers in their car or the in, at their headphones as they're listening to me. Which one it is? I'll have to go look it up. I'll, I'll, I'll watch it again uh, in the, over the weekend. I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. <laughs> Make a note because we often break out. You know, when we talk about a video clip or something like that. I'll jump on YouTube and find it and link it into the show notes mm. over at the website. How about actors? So, I mean, you mentioned Jet Li and, and Jackie Chan as actors you'd like to train with. Are they the people you? would call your favorite martial arts actors yeah i mean it depends on my mood but i really much i really much I, I very much enjoy watching uh watching jackie chan movies you know some of them are better than others but uh 
Oh, just just the just the movies themselves. I think they're uh, I think they're fantastic. If I'm in a more serious mood, you know, I like to I like to see stuff with uh, with Jet Li in it. But outside of that, really, I'm, I'm I'm not so much a name person. I mean, I enjoy watching Tony Jaw in movies, and uh, yeah. uh, I just I just enjoy watching watching anything that's that's even if it is all uh, cinematography, anything that's that just comes out is really cool. <laughs> I like to watch it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's I can't think about Jackie Chan and and not remember Rumble in the Bronx and and you know what was that ninety four ninety five and me and my two best friends at the theater opening night. You know, just watching that movie and how transformational that was for me and realizing what martial arts could be. I'd been training a long time by that point, but still whenever somebody brings up Jackie Chan, my mind goes to rumble in the Bronx and it goes to that ladder scene, <laughs> you know, right. You you know what I'm talking yes, about, right? You've seen the movie. Anybody that's seen that movie once remembers that scene. Cause it was so creative and so well done. And yet so real. Oh yeah. In, in, in a way that most people can't bring martial arts in. So awesome. Yeah, when I, when I, the movie that pops out at me, Jackie Chan, I, I can't remember the, the title of it. It was more of a, a comedy thing. You know, he played the, what was it? Almost hero, not a hero. Ah, can't remember what it's called. He had a little arrow that he had on a deal that would stick out from his chest so he could uh, play dead and stuff. Um, he was trying to kidnap the prince or kidnap some warlord or something. I, I can't remember that movie. I, I always think of that movie when I think of Jackie Chan. I don't know what one you're talking about. I'm gonna have to find that. Uh, man, I'm sorry. I wish I, I wish I, I had the something. title in the top of I my head. But I, I, that's all right. You know, that's that's the fun of the show notes. You know, I, I get to go back and do a little bit of research, and people are going, "Ah, what, what are you talking about?" And hopefully, they they come and check it out and see the other episodes we got. So it's okay. No worries. How about books? I love books. Uh, I think it's pretty Dude, obvious. Great. I said earlier, I was uh, I'm a big 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 fan of reading um, for multiple multiple reasons. I I like to think. I guess let's put it that way. Um, you can talk about martial arts books. I, you know, there's two that that really stand out that I think you know every martial artist should should read. And I guess that would be uh, the Book of the Five Rings and the Art of War. So Miyamoto, Miyamoto yeah. Musashi and uh, and Sun Tzu. But the the issue, I did kind of have a couple issues with those books. They were great books, but it's kind of like uh, movies. When you see a movie's coming out and you get all this anticipation for it, you start. We always say, you know, never walk in anywhere expecting anything, but we, we do this to ourselves. And you expect it to be some phenomenal movie, and then you watch it. And it was a great movie, but you're like, oh, it wasn't quite my expectation. I walked into those two books the same way, and um, so I was left a little short of what I thought I, I would get out of them. I, no, I don't want to take away from those books; they're great books. I just I walked in with too much anticipation. But I think a book that doesn't get the, uh, of course, it's a more modern book, but. A book that doesn't get the uh, the attention. I don't know if it ever got got really much attention, but it really awakened me during during that time. I was uh, just getting back involved in martial arts. Can't remember the author's name, but it was called Budo and the Bonsai. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of that one. That. It's a, yeah. a fantastic book, though, and it was very uh, talking about different types of warriors, different types of fight styles, and then how to apply those styles um, in different scenarios in modern day life. And, it was a really interesting book, um, but like I said, I enjoy a lot of books. So as far as authors, you know, I like I like Daniel Bellelli. Um, I like Bodie Sanders books, uh, stuff like that. I just like to read, uh, you know, anything philosophical or, or cultural. That's great. That's great. Yeah, we've uh, we've had some great book selections mm. here on the show, and certainly more than I'm able to read. Of course, do an episode every week, which means I'm recording at least an episode every week, and. Unless everybody starts talking about Five Rings and Art of War every week, it's going to take me a long time to catch up, if ever. So <laughs> thanks for sharing those. Budo and the Bonsai, that, that sounds really cool. Something that I don't think has been suggested before. Well, yeah, so. and it's a short book. It's, it's oh, easy to read. I'll I mean, if you're just, it, it's easy to read in, in a couple of days to a week. You know, it's a really short book and big words and the whole thing. So it's, it, it's a good one. Just it's easy to flip through. Awesome. So. Let's talk about where you're going. What do you have for, for goals? What's keeping you motivated with the martial arts? And tell us about that. Talk about, tell us about what you're looking forward to. All right. Well, you know, I have, I have, uh, my goals, are, I guess, are kind of split, and yet they're all the same thing. I have some personal goals. I have business goals. And then I have goals for each one of my students. And, I, and I, the one thing I do when I look at goals is I never want to forget um, the, the bottom line of my goals, and that's to help people. So my bottom line of my goals are my students and, and the goals that I have for them. Um, but, you know, building up from that, I, I, 
I don't really have any personal goals in the martial arts except for, you know, just to get better, train as much as I can. You know, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, I want to get to this rank or I want to get to this level or I want to do that. I, I, I do, but I just mostly want to be the best that I can. And I mostly just, I, I, I do it for myself and I do it for my students. But when it comes down to the business um, that we run, I mean, obviously, no one walks out and says, you know, and, that I feel 100 percent like this is my path and like this is what I'm supposed to do and then feels like you know 100 students is all they're supposed to have or one location or or whatever so I, I mean I do have long-term goals for the for the business once we kind of um, get things cleaned up get ourselves out of debt from my mess uh, you know from my teenage years and all that and start to get there I'd like to uh, uh, grow but I'd like to grow slowly I, I know that sounds weird I, I don't want any massive jumps I want to be able to be self-funded to keep this family oriented and um that no matter how big it gets to keep the same ideals that it's all about the individual or it's all about the person um so yeah my goals uh, i guess to, to to grow my business um and not for my name or, or for anything like that but just to not only continue with the opportunity to teach but to give other people the opportunity who might need um a road like i had and, and give them a place where they can go and and, and an outlet and then give them a place they could also turn around and show others and, and, and help others as well. So that's been that's been kind of the goals I've got set for the future. And and I just try to do something every day involving uh, my students. And I try to do something every day, especially with the new students and the ones that have been around for, for a little longer and work help work them towards their goals. And I feel like helping them get towards their goals is going to help me get towards my goals. Excellent. Wow. That's yeah. Yeah. I think that that's probably pretty solid uh, goals and ones that I'm going to guess a lot of people listening share, at least those that have martial arts schools. And I really like, I smiled. Of course, you can't see it. We're not on video, but when you, when you mentioned that you have goals for each of your individual students, that's something that I think only people that have taught can really identify with. And for those of you out there that aren't martial arts instructors. Yes, your instructor most likely has goal has a goal or probably more likely more than one <laughs> yes. for you and for every other single person in the class. Mm -hmm. So it's um, individualized. We we look at everybody as an individual and we go, okay, this yeah. this person, what's gonna get this person to the next level? What what's the next step for them and finding themselves? And I mean we talked about you know martial arts, the path of martial arts is in their, throughout their whole life may not be for everybody. But again, one, another one of the things that martial arts teaches, teaches you how to find yourself. It teaches you how to learn about yourself. It teaches you, I mean, everybody thinks they, they know who they are, but I thought I knew who I was too. And then I realized that I didn't, I didn't really, I really didn't know who I was at all. And, and, and I didn't take the time. It, you know, martial arts helps, helps with that, helps you learn to take the time um, to understand yourself a little bit better and what you want to yeah. do. Absolutely. And there, there's, again, more of the value of martial arts. I, mean, I think we could boil this down and turn it into a just kind of a public service announcement sort of commercial <laughs> for go. the martial arts, you know. So if people want to get a hold of you, follow you on social media, or maybe they, they know someone in the Oklahoma, you know, in the Newcastle area where you are that they want to get somebody enrolled, how would they find you? Um well, uh, I got a website, um, oklakicks.com, www.oklakicks.com. It's got a lot of videos and kind of how to get started. It's got a phone number, email address. I'm, I try to be very responsive. You know, I have the phone on me at all times. Outside of that, I'm on social media. Um, Corey Rose, uh, our, our school has a Facebook page, uh, Peace Warriors Martial Arts. And um, if anyone happens to come across like the Marshall Way Network, uh, you know, I'm a member of the, the Marshall Way Council as well. And uh yeah, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. If you want, if you want to find me, you can, uh, and and you know anybody. If anyone doesn't want to find me, um, I I will respond to you too. So great, and and of course we'll link all that stuff that you talked about it over on the website whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So, any parting advice? Any last words of wisdom you want to leave us with? Um, sure. I've been talking about this actually the past couple of weeks um, in, in my classes, and I had split it up under three talks, but I'm going to shorten this down very easily. And this is one of the things that I feel like is very important to yourself um, to success. And I think I think this is kind of a key to success for anybody. Uh, first of all, take time every single day. I don't mean every week. I mean every day. A few minutes of quiet time. Call it meditation. Call it prayer. Call it whatever you want. Take a few time, a few minutes of every day. Think very non-judgmentally about who you are right now, the good and the bad. 
Are you an angry person? Are you a happy person? What, what are some specific examples? Think about who you want to be, the type of person you want to be, and think about what it is you want to accomplish. Do that every day. And then, you know, you have to get up every day. And we all have those negative things. First thing in our head, I'm not a morning person. You know, we all have those self-doubts. We all have those fears. And you never truly get rid of that, but you can give them less power by not thinking on them, not dwelling on them. So I recommend from that point, once you kind of have a goal, you have that, that process in mind and you know your starting point, then you have to get rid of that doubt, um, that anxiety and that fear, you know, and not fight against it. My personal favorite is using mantras, you know, just something positive you repeat to yourself every morning, a thousand times if you have to, till it really starts to, starts to sink in. And be able to look at yourself in the mirror and take full responsibility for where you at, where you're at. Don't blame circumstance. Don't blame your mama. Don't blame anybody else. Your choices, whether you knew the outcomes or not, led you to where you are. And once you start thinking like that, then you can wake up every day and realize that you owe it to yourself to uh, say no to the extras. Sometimes you owe it to yourself to try a little harder and you owe it to yourself to reach those goals. You do deserve it but no one's gonna put it in front of you. It's not just gonna pop up in front of you. If you're waiting for the right opportunity, it's not gonna happen. You don't open a door, that this back door right here beside me will not open until I get up, I look for it, I know that I want it, and then I walk over and turn that knob. So that's my, that's my bit of advice. That's wonderful advice. And I hope people listen to that. I, I'd, I'd encourage everyone to go back, listen to that a couple times because there's some great wisdom in there, stuff that I think all of us, even if we've heard it, we need to hear it again. Maybe even hear it every day. I admit. You know, just a great, great, you know, mini life plan right there to get you on on the right track. I admit it. I recorded that and I play it to myself daily. Yes, it's in my own voice, but you know, I do. I play it to myself. I listen to my, I listen to it every time I start to get down on myself. And I did it in my most excited voice too, my motivational speaker voice, so that it's like me telling myself to to get in gear and make it happen. Yeah, yeah. I actually, um, for people that, that follow me personal, personally on social media may have seen, I just taped a card to my alarm clock. I'm famous for having the best of intentions, getting up early and then getting up and hitting that snooze bar a few too many times. I even have to get out of bed to hit it. I've moved it. <laughs> and that wasn't enough. And, and I can tell you offline, this this funny story that kind of wandered through all that. and, and But there's now an index card taped to it that says, how, how did I phrase it? Your dream hinges on you not hitting that snooze bar right now. <laughs> Definitely. And it's worked since I put that on there. I see it. I have to see it to hit the button. And you know what? I'm not going back to bed. All right. So That works. Thanks for sharing all that. Thanks for sharing everything on the show today, Mr. Rose, really appreciate you being here. Again, thanks for having me. It's an honor anytime. Anytime, you know, someone wants to take a, someone actually takes an interest or wants to take an interest in anything, I have to say it's a humbling and, and very honoring experience. Thanks for listening to episode 31 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Mr. Rose. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, including that video that we mentioned on the air about Superfoot Bill Wallace and Mr. Rose's son, Axel. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you for two things to help us, first, leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts, and that would help new listeners find our show. And if we read your review on the air, just go ahead and contact us, and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. Secondly, if we could just trouble you for a moment to tell someone that you know personally about the show and why you like it, we'd really appreciate that. Don't forget the great stuff we make here at Whistlekick. Sparring gear, shirts, pants, and a whole bunch more, all made for martial artists by martial artists. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.